All right, welcome to Hoops Tonight here at The Volume. Happy Tuesday, everybody. Round two coverage of the NBA playoffs here at Hoops Tonight is brought to you by Chase Freedom Unlimited. How do you cash back? So I wake up this morning. I'm walking over to my coffee machine to uh, sit down and watch some film, and it dawns on me. I'm like, I said at the beginning of last night's show I was going to talk about Knicks Heat, and then I totally forgot to. So I sincerely apologize to the Knicks fans and Heat fans or anybody who was interested in hearing a breakdown about that game. We are going to get to it. This morning, just going to go for like eight to 10 minutes, given my thoughts on that series. You guys know the drill before we get started. Subscribe to the Volumes YouTube channel so you don't miss any more of our videos. Follow me on Twitter at underscore JasonLT so you guys don't miss any show announcements. And if for whatever reason you guys miss one of these videos and you can't get back over to YouTube to finish, don't forget you can find them wherever you get your podcasts under hoops tonight. All right, let's talk some basketball. I have never in my time covering the league been as wrong about a team as I've been about this Miami Heat team. Now, in my defense, um, you guys know kind of the way we do this show. I'm, I'm going to pay attention to what I'm seeing on film and pay attention to the trends and what we learn about these teams from the regular season and try to use that to project forward. And the Heat, it desperately fighting for play-in position, went 12-13 and 13 over their last 25 games, got their asses kicked by the Atlanta Hawks at home in the first play-in game, and then were trailing by three late in the fourth quarter in the second playing game against the Chicago Bulls. So <clears throat> that was the information I was using to project forward. Uh, that said, I think where I went wrong is I did not properly account for the fact that this is a team that, one, is extremely well coached and will inevitably play above their pay grade in the playoffs. This is benefit of the doubt that I've given to the Warriors over the years that I should have applied to the Heat. That was my mistake. Jimmy Butler, same type of thing. A player whose impact goes so much higher into the playoffs. And I did factor these things in, but just not enough. I should have weighed them even more heavily than I did. Even as I looked at that Milwaukee Bucks series and I look at Giannis missing three games and, and just some of the crazy factors like Milwaukee having significant double-digit leads in the fourth quarter in each of the last two Miami Heat wins, it just uh, clouded my judgment a little bit and I was very wrong. I said they didn't have enough shot creation. Jimmy Butler, Bam Adebayo, and the guards have all been fantastic. Kyle Lowry again last night just manufacturing offense for them when they need it. I said they weren't big enough. They've soundly out-rebounded the Knicks, who, uh, who were one of the league's best rebounding teams this year, including just smashing them on the glass in the last two games. Um, and now they're up 3-1. And this series looks like it's over. Uh, I believe the Heat will win at this point probably in five, maybe six. Um, there are three dynamics, in my opinion, that have swung this series away from where I projected it. And I think I picked Knicks and six originally. That's obviously dead on arrival. There are three things I want to hit really quick. One, gap in spot-up conversion. The spot-up situations are, are much more convoluted than just three-point shooting. A lot of people focus on three-point shooting. I prefer spot-up uh, point per possession because one of the things you can do to beat a team in a spot-up situation is attack a closeout, right? That's it's not, it's a much more fluid situation. Basketball is more complicated than just how what's your three point percentage, right? Even when you look at three point percentages, there are different factors. How many isolation threes are you taking? How many bailout end of shot clock threes are you taking? Or are you only taking catch and shoot threes? Are you being left open by the opposing defense? Or are they panic chasing you off the line? All of that stuff factors in to what your three point percentage is. So that's why I prefer to look at spot up points per possession. Well, the Knicks were a middle of the pack spot-up shooting team during the regular season. They were not as bad as the narrative surrounding them coming into this series. That was a big part of why I picked them over the Cavs. The Knicks were a much, much better spot-up shooting team in the regular season than the Cavs were, and I thought that manu uh, manifested throughout the series. Well, 1.03 points per possession during the regular season. In the Game 1 loss, the Knicks converted spot-up possessions at 0 0.4 points per possession, so less than half the efficiency they had in the regular season. In the game three loss, 0 0.76 points per possession. So about two-thirds to three-fourths the efficiency that they had during the regular season. And then in game three, they were slightly better one point per possession, but still below their regular season average. So after, and guess what? They were up over 1.2 points per possession on spot-up situations in the game two win at home. So again, like Miami, Eric Spolster has been given the leeway because of the complete collapse of the Knicks spot-up players to load up on these Jalen Brunson pick-and-rolls and these ISOs and to load up on these uh, Julius Randle bully ball possessions 
And that's allowed them to force turnovers, force misses, get out and transition, find easier opportunities in the open floor. That, to me, has completely flipped the dynamic of the Knicks on offense. Their spot-up shooting and spot-up uh, closeout attacking, which was reliable for them all season, not great, but reliable, totally let them down in this series, and that completely messed up the offensive end for them. Secondly, gap in star performance. Every single time we did Knicks videos this year, this year, I told you guys that the Knicks will go as far as Jalen Brunson and Julius Randle take them. Um, they need star production. And Jalen Brunson has been great throughout this postseason run, but Julius Randle just has not. Now, in his defense, I do think the ankle has played a role. He was in such a great jump-shooting rhythm throughout the regular season, and that got disrupted by him being away from the game uh, to rest an ankle injury. So, I mean, I'd love it, it might have something to do with the postseason, might have something to do with the way he's guarded, but I do think the injury has played a role. But the reality is, is in this series, they've combined to average just 45 points per game on only okay efficiency, and both have been ice cold from three. That's the one thing with Jalen Brunson that hasn't been working, is he's calling for these ball screens, and he's getting pretty good looks going to his right, which is where left-handed shooters like. Good balance, good lift, and Jalen Brunson just can't stick these pull-up threes right now. It's been a big problem. Julius Randle has 13 turnovers so far in three games. I think Jimmy Butler and Bam Adebayo have soundly outplayed them. Uh, they're also averaging 45 points per game, but on much higher efficiency, much better playmaking, and both of them are monumentally better as defensive players. So after outplaying Mitchell and Garland in round one to swing that series, the Brunson-Randle duo just has not been good enough in this second round series against the Miami Heat. And then last, last but not least, the rebounding. Um, the Knicks were the second best rebounding team in the league this year. They grabbed 32% of their own misses. That's how dominant they were on the offensive glass. Guess what? The Miami Heat grabbed 55.5% of all available rebounds in the two wins in Miami to go up 3-1. to one. So even though the Knicks are the bigger, more physical, more athletic team, the Heat have played more physical, have played bigger, and have looked like the more well-coached, more desperate team throughout this series. Um, and it's allowed them to beat a Knicks team that I think has more talent up and down the roster, albeit uh, I think you can say definitively that uh, uh, Butler and Bam Adebayo are a much better playoff duo in terms of their star performance. But, you know, on the Knicks front, it's it's just something that they're going to have to come to terms with. That Julius Randle piece, if, is, is, is it – um, the injury, I don't know, but that's going to be the weak piece. I think, J I think Jalen Brunson has definitively proved himself as a playoff player and a guy that you can have in this role, but I think they might need to upgrade that wing forward star position to have a real chance to contend looking into the future. Last note on the Miami heat. This is guys, they're one win away from being in the conference finals three times in the last four years. In a conference that has a really good Boston Celtics team, a really good Philadelphia 76ers team, an outstanding Milwaukee Bucks team, the fact that they've been one of the final two standing in three of the last four years is incredibly impressive. You have uh, It's a testament to Eric Spolster, who I believe is the best coach in basketball, the best at making opposing teams and, and uh, schemes uncomfortable and making teams go to um, uh, areas of their game that they're not great at. It's a testament to Jimmy Butler and his success as a playoff player. This guy has soundly outplayed uh, Tatum and Brown in the 2020 bubble to go to the NBA Finals, soundly, um, soundly outplayed Giannis Antetokounmpo this year, right? To uh, and now Giannis was hurt, but in the two games down the stretch in Game Four and Game Five of that series, Jimmy was just the better player, particularly at the end of games. I thought he soundly outplayed Jason Tatum in the conference finals last year. Just obviously didn't quite have the talent at his disposal, but he still was one shot away from stealing that series, despite being at a mag like a massive talent disadvantage. And here he is right now, outplaying Jalen Brunson and Julius Randle. So I mean. I've learned my lesson, and this team is going to be just like the the Golden State Warriors for me moving forward, where I just have to give them an, a huge amount of the benefit of the doubt. And if we're sitting in early April next year, and the Miami Heat are you know thirty nine and thirty eight, and we're like, man, they're mediocre. This roster isn't very good. Blah 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 blah. When it comes time to start picking in the playoffs, I'm going to be tempted to pick Miami in every single series because. They just find they just find a way.
I, it's 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 truly impressive. It's a testament to just everything I love about the game of basketball. Talent's important, but it's not what wins the day. It's a combination of your talent with your uh, schematic approach, your basketball IQ, your coaching, the superstars and their ability to overcome uh, uh, less than ideal situations. Shout out to the Miami Heat, man. They, they're doing it again. They're doing it again right in front of our eyes. All right, guys, I will be back. Uh, we're doing a double video tonight, so we'll be going live on AMP, I believe, right after Celtic Sixers, and then we'll be going uh, just on YouTube later in the evening after Nugget Suns. I appreciate you guys, and I'll see you later tonight.